Well, we are continuing in our study of Hebrews this morning, so if you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 13, we're going to be looking at verses 5 and 6, and if you remember, I had actually thought about doing 1 through 7 all together one Sunday, and then I realized, I came to my senses and said, well, there's no way I can do that. Then I actually thought, okay, maybe I can do 4 through 6, and I, then I realized, do I really want to hit them with that kind of one-two punch on Sunday? Because if you remember, last week we talked about marriage and defiling the, the, the marriage bed, and we talked about adultery, and we talked about sexual immorality. Those are hard subjects to deal with or to talk about, I guess, maybe in, in this particular form, although they're incredibly important, aren't they? We all need to hear the words that were spoken last week, including myself, but we also need to hear the words that are spoken this week about money. Money. It's one of those issues, right, that's, that's, that concerns all of us. Every single one of us in this room is concerned about money in some form or fashion. That's the reality of our reality. We have to have money. We have to have money to live. We have to have money to, to buy the things that we not only need, food, shelter, all of these types of things, clothing, but we need money. We desire to have money for the things that we want. But boy, money can be a sticky subject, can it? It can be hard just because of the way we view money and the way that God's word says we should view money. And sometimes they come into conflict. Oftentimes they come into conflict. And so I want to ask you this morning, by the power of God's Spirit, ask Him to allow you to be open to what He has for you this morning. Because these are hard verses when you talk about how we're supposed to not covet, how we're not to, uh, to be content, rather, how we are to not love money. How do you, how do you determine what you love and don't love? How, how can you be content when you're not content? These feelings that you have, how do you deal with feelings? Well, we're going to be talking about that here in just a little bit. But I want to ask you this morning to, again, be open to the power of God's Spirit and what He has for each one of us this morning as we look at this subject of money. So Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's pray. Father, I ask you this morning to help me to speak through me this morning, please. And I ask that you would open up hearts to hear what you have, eyes to hear, to see rather, maybe where there's areas of blindness. I ask that you would help all of us, maybe where there's Areas where we are loving money a bit too much, where we are discontent. We pray this morning that you will reveal those things to us and that we would turn back to you, that we would ask you, help us. Help us to, to love you more than money. Help us to be content in every situation we find ourselves in, understanding that you are a sovereign and loving God who provides all that we need. So be with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, money can be one of those topics that's difficult to discuss because, well, uh, other reasons that it's difficult to discuss is because people are all over the place, right? If I knew that every single one of you really struggled with a love of money and every single one of you were discontent, then I could drive in and I could say, okay, people, this is what we're going to be talking about this morning, but we're all over the board, right? As far as the love of money, for some people, Money is just a means to an end, right? We, we, we need money, so I pay my bills and that type of thing, but give generously and so forth. And so money isn't that big of a struggle. Sure, periodically, kind of have to tamper it down, say, Lord, help me, I'm starting to love money a little too much, that type of thing. For others of us, we really love money, right? We love money. We love what it can buy us. We love the fun things we can do, all of those types of things. Or we're discontent because we don't have the things that we would like to have. So when, it, when you deal with money, we're all over the board. It's purposes. Why, what, what's money for? How do we deal with wealth? How do we handle our money? How much should I give away? How much should I save? All of these types of things. But the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about money, doesn't it? And sometimes we could think the Bible says maybe things that are a little conflicting. And so how do we deal with these scriptures? 
The ones that seem, that appear on the surface to be conflicting with one another. Things about wealth. Because on the one hand, it says that wealth is good, that it is a blessing from God, right? That's to be enjoyed. And we are to be thankful for the blessings of God and enjoy those blessings. Just a few scriptures to that, that speaks to that. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have, have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, Proverbs tells us, and he adds no sorrow with it. Ecclesiastes tells us, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. Check this out. This is the gift of God. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Notice he didn't say anything negative about them being rich. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. But then, on the flip side of that same coin, we discover the Bible has a lot to say about wealth and its dangers. Wealth can be incredibly dangerous as well. It can corrupt our morals. It has the power to divert our attention from God to money and stuff, things that we want. So there's great dangers inherent in money. And Scripture has very serious warnings about this. And we ignore them to our peril. What does Scripture say? Just a few verses of the many verses in the Bible about money. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And he said to them... Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. As far as what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And then a final verse. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I think when we really look at these verses and we look at many others throughout Scripture, we see one One theme or one word, I guess you would say, that really is at the heart of many of these verses and and at the heart of why we oftentimes run into trouble when it comes to money is covetousness. Covetousness. It's at the heart of these warnings. C.H. Spurgeon said, I've been in a lot of testimony meetings and I've heard a lot of people share how they've sinned. And I've had people come to me and make confession of sin. But in all my life, I've never had one person confess the sin of covetousness to me. What is covetousness? What does it mean to covet? We oftentimes think of it as as yearning or or a desire to possess something. And and oftentimes, we think of it in in terms of what someone else has, right? We, We think of the, the, the type of life a person has, the quality of life, the things that they do, the, the, the stuff that they have, right? The home that they have, the cars that they have, the boats that they have, whatever it may be. The savings account that they have, the retirement account that they have. It could be any number of things, and certainly that is a form of covetousness when we are looking at other people and desiring to have what they have. We all are very familiar with this. But that's not necessarily the case every time as far as wanting what other people have. There's a lot of ways that we can be covetousness. And I think covetousness is one of the most insidious of sins. Because we don't acknowledge how harmful covetous thoughts are to us. We see them as harmless, don't we? Well, no one knows. No one knows what I'm really desiring. It's all in here, right? Right? I don't really talk to people about it, so it's not really harming anyone. I'm not making a big deal of it. 
But covetousness can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. The big one is just a general discontentment with your life. A general discontentment with your job and your marriage and your children and your house and your car and where you live and maybe your church and just a general discontentment about life. Always seeing or believing, rather, that the grass has to be greener on the other side. And that's just a lie. That's just a lie. We always, we, we, we start to think in those terms, right? Oh, this is so hard. It's got to be better over there. They have to have it better. That's not necessarily the case. And I think all of us have learned that over years, haven't we? When we think it's better over there, and then maybe you get there and you realize, wow, I didn't realize how good it was over there. This general sense of discontentment comes at its root level from a disbelief in God. A disbelief in God's goodness, a disbelief in God's graciousness, a disbelief in God's sovereignty, a disbelief that God absolutely loves us and desires to take care of us. And so when things don't go our way, we start to wonder, does God, does God really care? Does God really hear my prayers? I've been praying for this thing for a long time. And yeah, he does hear our prayers. And he's always going to answer our prayers in the way that he knows is absolutely best for us. So maybe we've been working really, really hard. We do everything unto the Lord. And I deserved that raise. I deserved that promotion. Why didn't I get that? Yeah, maybe. Why didn't I get that? Well, maybe you didn't get it because God is protecting you. God knows that if you go down that path, if you get that raise, then that's going to start diverting your attention a little bit to stuff, to money, to any number of things. But maybe he does give you that raise. Praise God. Rejoice in that. Covetousness is harmful because it involves an attitude. An attitude that stands in stark contrast to the attitude that we are to have as kingdom people. And I'm talking to you. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, you are a kingdom person. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. An attitude of covetousness means that you have an attitude of wanting to acquire things, longing for them, setting thoughts and attention on them. And in so doing, when we do those types of things, those things are drawing our attention and affections away from God. And so that's the big problem with covetousness, is that the more we think about the things that we want, the more we think about the things that we don't have, the less time we're thinking about what we do have in Christ, the less time we're talking about the great blessings that we have in Him. It draws our affections away from the one that we should have all of our affections toward. And it could dilute it into a lot of different places, right? Because our affections can go in a lot of different directions. And they could be placed on a lot of different things. And when that happens, they're drawn away from God. The love of money. The love of money is one of the most common forms, right, of covetousness. Primarily because money can buy us the things that we want. It could buy us the things that we covet. Money. It could be used to just to secure so many of the things that we want and believe are going to bring us happiness, that are going to bring us security, that are going to bring us satisfaction, all of those types of things. We think money is the answer. And so the love of money becomes a problem for many of us. There are numerous examples throughout our culture today where we could talk about the love of money and where it gets people in trouble, but I don't know if you saw it in the, in the paper this past week, but in uh, Warren County, which is Front Royal, you know, a couple of hours from here, 14 leading county officials were arrested and indicted on embezzlement charges. 14 in one county. Why? Love of money. When you start to look into the different accounts and what was happening, and that's how, it all had to do with personal gain, right? It all had to do with getting a little bit more. 
And so now we have 14 county officials that have been indicted on embezzlement charges. Can you imagine what that county is going through? The broken trust, the confusion. What's next? What does this look like? Oh, here we go. How long are we got to deal with all of this stuff being in the news? And, and, and it takes away, right? It takes away from the, the functioning of the county and the community. These people who had real responsibilities, these people who were supposed to be taking care of the people in their community. Now, what's happening? So the love of money has led to major issues in a county that's very, very close to us. Broken trust. And the biblical examples abound, right? We don't have to look very far. Achan, Achan's love of money cost Israel a defeat. It also cost the lives of 36 fellow Israelites, as well as his own life and the life of his family, as well as his flocks. Naaman, we know Naaman was cleansed of leprosy, right? Elisha, when, when asked, Elisha, you've healed me. Let, me. let me bless you. Let me give you a gift. And what does Elisha do? No, 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 no. This is the work of the Lord. You don't have to give me anything. And so he leaves, and of course, Elisha's servant kind of gets into his mind, wait a minute, we have an opportunity here. So Elisha's servant goes back, unbeknownst to Elisha, and says, Naaman, listen, you know, Elisha was just being kind. Really, we're a little short right now, it's a little tight, and he was just being kind. But we, that money that you were talking about would really be helpful. And of course, Naaman is more than happy to, yes, here, please, give it to Elisha. I want to bless you in this way. So of course, Elisha finds out about this. His servant, Gehazi, 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 lies about it. And so what does Elisha do? Elisha curses his servant for what he has done, and he receives the leprosy that Naaman had. Why? Love of money. Judas was greedy as well as traitorous, right? Willing to betray the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. And Ananias and Sapphira, we know this story, they paid for their greed and attempted deceit with their life. So let me emphasize again that it is the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. And that leads to deceptions and webs of lies, leads people to losing their possessions and even their lives due to their love of money. Now, if it were just the, the money, that money that leads to these types of things, then, then these verses that we read a little bit earlier, right, about God's blessing and, and wealth as a blessing, all those types of things, that wouldn't make any sense at all, right? But we have to be careful because it's not money. It, it is the love of money that we're talking about here. But how can money, wealth, be seen as, as a blessing of the Lord while at the same time be the source of, a source of such calamity and such destruction. I think it has everything to do with our attitude toward what has been given to us. And that's what we have to remind ourselves. It has been given to us or not given to us. Paul tells us that he had learned to be content in whatever situation he found himself, right? Whether hungry and in need or plenty and in abundance, he was content. He was fine. Because he, he didn't find his value, he didn't find his security, he didn't find his satisfaction in what he had or did not have. He found it in Christ and in Christ alone. So he could say this. So how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point? How do we have an attitude of contentment and not one of covetousness? Now, granted, Paul was a human being, so we, we can't say, well, that, that was Paul. I mean, that, that, that was Paul. Really? You expect us to have this kind of attitude? Yeah. Because was a, Paul was a sinner just like we are. Paul was a redeemed sinner just like we are. Paul had God's spirit just like we do. Did Paul like sleeping in a cold cave when, when there was nowhere else to go with, a head, with his head on a rock? Probably not. But he was okay. He was fine. Because at the end of the day, that, that was the most important thing. Whether he had a nice warm room to stay in or whatever it was, he had an idea that this is just temporary. And whether I have a lot and it's comfortable and I have a nice comfy bed or not, whether I have the food that I want or I just have to eat hardtack all the time, it doesn't matter. So we need to start moving in that direction to have more of that kind of attitude. That at the end of the day, the wealth of the world Oh, good, it can be good, and God can bless us in that. That's not the end all. 
That's not what this life is all about. So how do we? How do we move toward this? I think there's really three things that we need to start thinking about more and more. The first one is gratitude. The second one is generosity. And the third one is an understanding of God's constant companionship with us. So the first one is we must always be grateful for what God has given to us. And we must not fall into the same trap that the Israelites fell into that, that's talked about in Deuteronomy 28 where he says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you and hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. There is no greater example of God's provision to a people than the people of Israel. Yet they were not thankful. They were not thankful for all that God had done for them. How do we know? Because they had everything they needed. It tells us right here. They had everything they needed, the abundance of all things. Yet they were not joyful and glad. If we think, we think if anyone had an opportunity, had a reason rather to be joyful and glad, it was the Israelites. They had entered into this special relationship. God had provided everything. Granted, it may not be exactly what you want. You know, T-bones weren't falling from heaven, but manna was. And it kept them from starving to death. God was providing everything they needed. Yet what do we see them continually doing? Grumbling and complaining about God's provision in their life. They paid the penalty for their ungrateful hearts. We must always acknowledge that all wealth is God's wealth and whatever we are enabled to obtain through righteous and diligent labor or maybe even through inheritance or any other God-honoring way is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. And we are to receive it with gratitude these blessings of, of monetary gain and respond to God with joy and gladness. How often do we do that? How often do we, at the end of a week or at the end of every two weeks and when our pay period is, is, has come, right, and we check our balance at the local bank and we're like, okay, great, it was deposited, fantastic, we can pay the bills now, that type of thing. How often do you check the balance and just take a moment and say, Father, thank you. And I'll be honest with you, I don't do it often. I'll check the balance, make sure we're okay. All right, let's move on. And I'm, I'm asking you, I'm kind of confessing to you, I guess, to, to help you to think about that as well. How often do you check your balance and take a moment? Father, thank you for your provision. I'll tell you what, after this week of sermon prep, I'm going to do it a lot more. A lot more. Everything is from our God. He is a gracious and loving God. Let us take the time to be grateful and to thank him for what he has given to us. Let me just say this, just kind of as a side note. It is not wrong to pursue higher paying jobs. Because it's you know, more money, that's going to help the family, that's going to help us to save, that's going to, those types of things. It's not wrong to pursue higher paying jobs. It's not wrong to desire a, a better car or a better home, nicer home, larger home, whatever those things may be. I mean, when you think about Abraham and Job, they were extremely wealthy, right? It's not how much you have. It's, it's, it's not a desire to, to have a, a better car, a nicer car, whatever it is. It's the love of money. It's finding your security in that bigger car, bigger house, bigger paycheck. It's, it's starting to look at those things as, as that's where you derive your value, your worth, all of those things, because you have a nice house, because you have a nice car, because you have that promotion and you have this title after, before your name now or whatever it may be. When we start to desire things for those reasons and those purposes, that's when we've entered into the love of money aspect of this. Love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. All right. All right, this is another little side note, but 
if it's for real, I am rejoicing. I don't know if you guys recently saw it, but Benny Hinn recently confessed, I guess, that he's been preaching the, the gospel of, of wealth and prosperity and that type of thing, and he has recently come to realize that that was wrong of him. And from what I have read, it seems as though he has confessed that, repented of that, and desires to finish strong, not preaching a gospel of health and wealth and prosperity. Not in the form that he was, anyway. Praise God for that. And he, was the first, he would be the first one to tell you the reason I did that was not for the cause of the gospel. It was for the love of money. For the love of money. And for that, he has caused many people pangs of grief. Praise God that he has repented of that. Though. May we pray that indeed he will continue in the way that he seems to be going now. This money that we desire. It's not, again, the desire to have more money, the desire, to, it's the longing for it and trusting in it that is sinful. David tells us this in, in Psalm. He says, if riches increase, do not set your hearts upon them. If riches increase, do not set your hearts upon them. Do not start to set your hopes in them that everything's going to be great now. We have more money. More money can be good, don't get me wrong. But if that's what we're placing our hope in, if that's what we're placing our, our, our hopes that life is going to be so much better now, then we're placing our hopes in the wrong place. Job says it well when he says, if I have made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand had found much, this also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For I would have been false to God above at the end of the day, trust in money is distrust in God. When we are pursuing wealth through righteous and, and diligent labor, and God blesses our efforts, we must always keep in mind that God desires for us to be content and grateful for all that he blesses us with. Work hard. Work hard and, and get the promotion. Work hard and do your work unto the Lord, as unto the Lord. And if you are blessed with more money or a, or a, a bigger uh, promotion or whatever those things are, praise God, worship him, be thankful for that. But if, and be content. But at the same time, if you don't get that promotion or that raise or whatever, be content. Because we believe, if we believe that God is sovereign, that God loves us, it is for our good that we did not get whatever it was that we were desiring in that time, in that moment. And in that moment, what do we do? Lord Jesus, you knew my heart in this. You know that I desired to have that, but I didn't get it, so I worship you now. And for whatever reason it didn't happen, I'm grateful to you because I believe that you love me and that even in that, you were protecting me from something. So thank you for that. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's not naturally how we think. But I think that's how Scripture would have us to think, if indeed we believe that God is a loving God who is sovereign over all. That's the way that we need to start thinking about these things. But it's not enough just to receive and rejoice and be grateful. That's, that's huge, the be grateful part. We must also receive and release. And sometimes that's hard to do especially if things are a little tight, especially if we have a, a financial goal that we are trying to reach, right? Well, if I, if I don't give as much this month, that gets us a little closer. And once we get to that, once we get to that amount in the bank account or whatever it is, then we can start giving. How many of you guys have thought that before? And how many of you guys have gotten to that point and you say, oh, it would be really good if we got to this point. That would be better. Or with this money that we were saving, you know what? The car's starting to look kind of, maybe we should start saving toward the car. We'll give more when that's taken care of. Don't get me wrong. There are times when you need to save. There's times when you need to put back. There's times when you need to get the new car, all of those types of things. But let us not get into the trap of thinking, when this is done, we will. God is gracious in what he gives. I am continually amazed. And when you look at what uh, uh, per capita and, 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 and um, what is it, as far as the amount of income given toward uh, uh, charities and that type of thing, per 
household income and those types of things, you would think that, you know, it would be, you know, maybe one of the richer states, bigger states, California, New York, that we see gives more. But indeed, it, you guys know this probably, Mississippi. Mississippi, pretty much every year, leads the list when it comes to charitable giving. Not necessarily how much total was given, but when you look at per household income and the percentage given out of, out of each income, Mississippi. They are 50th in wealth. That is a poor state. Yet they give. They're generous. So brothers and sisters, we need to start thinking about that in terms of our lives. When God gives to us, are we giving out of that? Or we're we waiting till we get a little safer? Are we waiting till we get a little more comfortable? Are we waiting till we get that a bank account up to this amount? And then we'll give. We need to change our thinking if that's where we are and start to think, God, I am grateful for what you have given to me. I am grateful for what I have received from your hand. And now help me to have a heart of releasing it, of being a blessing to other people. Now, how much that is, is between you and God, right? That's what Paul tells us. It's with a cheerful heart that he desires for us to give. He doesn't prescribe you need to give this certain amount. No, he says, what you do give, give with a cheerful heart. That's not always easy, is it? Not again when you are looking at your bills for the month and you realize, oh, this is going to be tough. But I'm committed to giving this much every month, so okay, I'm just going to do it. Sometimes it hurts. It's in that moment when it's hurting to write that check when we're just like, oh, I really wish I could use some of this money to use over here and here. We just have to sit back and say, oh, Father, thank you for this. Thank you for this. And I'm asking that this check that I'm writing right now, that you use it for your kingdom purposes, that you are glorified through this. And I know that whatever shortcoming may come, shortfall may happen, you're going to provide for our needs. Lord, help me to be confident of that. But Pastor, you don't understand. I, I, I hear what you just said. You said that God will provide for our needs. But... I've had situations where I had need and God didn't come through. How do you explain that? I love Jesus. I've tried to follow Jesus. But I've had situations where I couldn't pay bills. They didn't come through for me. And then my comment is, God provides in a lot of different ways, doesn't he? I'm constantly amazed at the school that meets here and the ways that God provides for them. I mean, Kimberly will go and she'll check the P.O. box and there will be a check in there for $2,800 and she has a bill sitting on her desk for $2,800, those types of things. I mean, God does those types of things. But also God works through his people, doesn't he? And so if someone were to say that to me, hey, listen, I had a need and God didn't provide, I would ask, did you tell your brothers and sisters about it? Did you keep it to yourself or, or did you tell your pastor? Pastor, this is what's happening in my life and I'm struggling right now financially and this is the bill coming up and I don't. Did you tell anyone? Well, no. I mean, that's, that's kind of private, isn't it? Well, it's all, it also can be very prideful. I don't want to tell people. I don't want to tell people I don't have enough money. Brothers and sisters, if we're family, we're family. And if you're struggling, we want to know it as your family. And we want to come alongside you and help you. That's one way that God provides. That's one way that he provides for our needs is through the body of Christ. But we also have to be ready to respond. And that's the second part of this, generosity, right? The second way of, of, to cultivate an attitude of contentment instead of covetousness is through generosity. Wealth is not only meant to be a blessing to us and to our family, but to others as well. He desires to use us, as a con use us as a conduit as of his provision to others. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and following says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Brothers and sisters, let us get the word here of what he is saying. Yes, everything that comes into our lives is good. We should be praising God, but let us be careful of the uncertainty of riches. Let us not place our hope in that. 
Instead, let us be grateful and let us bless others by being generous and ready to share. Because the ROI, the return on investment, may not be seen in the here and now, other than helping a brother or sister who's struggling and those types of things, what a blessing that is to be able to see them help through this situation. But think about the foundation that's building for the future, the treasures that are being laid up in heaven. So the ROI may not be big in the here and now, may not be anything as far as what we can tell, but God is keeping count. God is the one who remembers the things we do and the reasons we do it and our heart attitudes in it. And he's the one that's storing the riches for us in heaven. We need to remember these types of things. So we need to be grateful. We need to be generous. This is the kind of life described in Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blesses the man who fears the Lord, who greatly de delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Now look at this attitude that he has here. And how he handles these riches. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. I love this description, don't you? It carries over into the New Testament. We just mentioned this a moment ago. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A couple of guys were at a coffee shop sitting there having their morning coffee they were retired that's that they were sitting there talking over the morning news that's what they do every morning right they, re they read the paper and they've just read about this this famous guy in their community multi 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 millionaire and one of the guys just kind of quips well i wonder how much he left wondering meaning how much did he leave you know how much wealth did he have and that type of thing i wonder how much he left and the other guy looks at him he said he left every single dime because that's the reality, right? We can't take anything with us. So what God gives to us, yes, we use for, for our needs and all of those types of things, but we also use for kingdom purposes. And I heard Alistair Begg one time give this story. He, he, said, he said, now listen, this is completely fictitious. Understand that, so I'll, I'll give that preamble to this. This is completely fictitious. You understand that. But a man shows up at the pearly gates, right? And he's there, and, and Gabriel is there, and he says, oh, we've been waiting for you, so glad to see you, so excited, but what is all this stuff? And the guy's like, oh, you were, I mean, God bless me so much on earth. I mean, look, look at all the buckets of gold I have, and look at this file right here. These are all my stocks and bonds and annuities and those types of things. I mean, I was blessed, and I was able to use them and multiply the wealth and that type of thing. I'm really excited about what I'm going to be able to do here. And Gabriel just kind of chuckled and said, no, it doesn't work that way. You, that's no good here. You can't use any of that. That's the reason you were blessed there. So you could use them, yes, to pay your bills, yes, to buy your house, yes, all that stuff, but also for kingdom purposes. That's where you were to invest them there. That's when you were going to see the return on investment here. Sorry. See that dumpster over there? That's where it goes. Brothers and sisters, I say that to say we have this opportunity. We have this opportunity in this life to use everything that God gives to us for his glory. And so let us not feel guilty when we have a nice car, reliable car, when we have a nice house and live in a nice neighborhood and, and all of those types of things. Those are God's blessings upon us. And let's praise God for it. But let's not get so caught up in these things that we start to hoard our wealth that we start to hold it all really tightly, right? Well, what if my new nice car breaks down? I need, I need money to fix it or whatever it is, right? No, 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 no. Lord, you graciously give. Now help me, give me the heart to generously give so that your kingdom work can be accomplished now. So that I'm not worried about the return on investment now. I'm not worried about, you know, how much my stocks and bonds and that type of thing are going to do now and I can put more. No, 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 no. I'm more concerned about kingdom returns. Help me to have that kind of attitude. So that when I leave this earth, I can leave looking forward to the foundations that have been built with my wealth here. That I can look forward to the riches that are in heaven because of the kingdom work that my heart, that, that I had a heart to do here for you and for your glory and for your honor. These things are not easy, are they? So it sounds so good. Oh, we receive and out of the receiving and the, the abundance, we just, oh, here you go. And we, it's hard. Let's just be honest. It's hard. 
but I think he helps us to understand how we can make it a little easier. And he does that with the last part of this verse. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can say confidently, confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, there are a lot of glorious things that could be said about the new covenant era that we are in, right? A lot of glorious things that could be said about the fact that we have been justified. That Christ's blood has covered our sins. Another would say maybe, maybe the greatest thing about this new covenant era that we are in is that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. That is glorious. Maybe another would say, yes, the covenant era is awesome, but the, the thing that really stands out to me, the one, the one thing I love about this is that I'm completely forgiven. Completely forgiven. There's a lot of wonderful things that we could say about this new covenant era that we are in, right? But I think what he says here is right there at the top of the list as well. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can say, confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. And what can man do to me? The author of this letter has spent a lot of time talking about the greatness of Jesus in so many different ways, right? But out of that long list is the astounding truth that Jesus was with them and would never leave them. That one day they would see him again in all of his glory. The riches of Bill Gates are nothing in comparison to the reality that God is with us. And the reality that that will never change. Never. God is with us. And he will never, ever leave us nor forsake us. Like I said earlier, I know that it can be difficult when we talk about being content and not have this love of money. Well, how do I change it? I mean, I feel I, I love money. How do I change this feeling that I have? Well, I'm discontent. How do I change this feeling of discontentment? Wouldn't you, can't you just give me a different command like give to the poor? That's easier. All right, done. But how do I change the love? How do I change whether I'm content or discontent? That's more difficult. I, I think he gives us the answer here. He says, listen, you need to weigh everything else in this life against this ultimate truth that God is with us, that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. And I love the fact that he says it in this way, so we can confidently say. So brothers and sisters, when you're struggling, when you're hurt, when, you're, when you feel that love of money starting to come up, when you're starting to fret and you're starting to get anxious over the bills that are still there that have to be paid, or you're, you're, you're really just struggling with covetousness and you just really want what that person has. You really want this new whatever it may be. And you know, Lord Jesus, this isn't your will for me. This isn't where you want me to be in this heart place that I'm in right now and this anxiousness and covetousness. I know it's not. You can go to this and we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, man can do a lot to us, right? I mean, let's be honest. The church in Rome that this letter was written to, a lot was being done to them. Their possessions were being confiscated. They were being put in jail. Man can do a lot. Man can beat us. Man can kill us. But what the author is saying here at the end of the day, really, that's all they can do? Is that all they can do? What does Paul say? He says, listen, to die is what? To live is Christ. To die is gain. Paul got it. It's not about the stuff that we have. It's not about what's being taken away from us or what's being, it's the fact that if I'm living, I get to live for Christ. And if I die, I'm okay. So if man kills me, I'm all right. So in reality, what can man do to me? Nothing. Nothing of eternal significance. 
He can destroy our body. He can kill our body. But he cannot take away the fact that God is with us for all times. He is with us and he will never, ever forsake us. Man can never take away the riches that we have in heaven from living for, for, from living for him in the here and now. So brothers and sisters, how do we change this heart attitude? Certainly it comes from having from being grateful for all that God has given to us continually when we get that new check or whatever. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for how you have provided in this way and so many others. Then it's a matter of being generous. Lord, how would you have, have me to bless others? How would you have me to bless, uh, to, 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 to give toward kingdom work? What does that look like? But then ultimately remembering that no matter what happens and no matter where we are financially and no matter the struggles that we're going through, at the end of the day, God is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is always here to help us through everything that we're going through in the good times and the bad. He is our helper. The church in Rome lived with this kind of attitude, giving up possessions with joy. And the author wanted them to keep that same kind of kingdom attitude and he desires for us to have the same one. To keep in perspective as we think about what really matters, to live in, in such a way that reflects the gratitude that we have for all that he has given, enjoying the great blessings while understanding that they do come from his hand and not just our labor alone. He is a generous God. We, in turn, reflect that generosity by being a blessing to others. But above all, remembering that God is always with us, always. And in the grand scheme of things, isn't that all that really ultimately matters? Everything that we have in this life is one day going to be burned up. It's all but a vapor. But our life with God is eternal. Let us keep focused on that.